So next is Marin Todorov. You probably know him from uh, the Ray Wenderich tutorials or, uh, or used his frameworks for the awesome animations. And uh, I just want a big applause because he, he's a real hero. He filled up for uh, Christoph, who can make it because he's ill. So please, a big applause for Marin. <laughs> so. It's for you. Enjoy. The Indypocalypse is upon us. It comes for you and me. And it's going to last until we all make zero dollars per day. The Indies are getting extinct in the Apple ecosystem, and we're worried about it. I first noticed this term last summer in my favorite newsletter about iOS, iOS goodies. Tiago from iOS goodies has seen this term used previously in other contexts, and he really thought that the abundance of blog posts about indies moving out of the App Store uh, perfectly fit the term in the apocalypse. But do you remember the great app rush? Like 15,000 apps in the App Store, and everybody thought that they're going to make tons of gold. It was beautiful. It was early, and it was great. So we are, we are all very excited. I personally remember a dark winter in Berlin when it was really cold, uh, there was a lot of snow, uh, wolves were howling distance, and I managed to install my provisioning profile, which was perfect because I could run something on a device. And at this point, I thought that everything's going to be just great. And um, after four rejections and, a, and an email from the HQ in uh, Apple's HQ in London, I felt like everything's going to be great. And it was. That was fantastic times. But of course, that's over with. So what happened meanwhile? What is going on? Why, in the words of Ray Wenlick, there's a sense of doom and gloom over the community? Is really the end apocalypse in the end of all iOS indies upon us? Let's have a look at some of these posts that were featured in this dark newsletter issue from last year. First, Jared. He worked for eight months, on average 60 to 80 hours a week. I mean, 60 to 80 a week, that's a lot, right? Like, no going out in the sun, no going to the bathroom, just working and working. So imagine that. He says his mental health suffered, his family suffered. He earned 32K over a stretch of a year. Pretty bad. And uh, another post from this newsletter. It's called My OS Indie Game Numbers. And it's about Chad, who earned around $500 from three games he worked on. Pretty bad. Weekends, nights, everything. That's really awful. And finally, Sam's app, on which he says that he worked here and there, and he even tweeted when he released it, but still $300 first day. Uh, pretty disappointing. He said that he was happy not to be an indie. So pretty, pretty dark. And yes, for indies, it's not really easy on the App Store, because let's have a look at the uh, competition, end to end. And you can't beat Disney's prices. I don't really, I'm not really sure that if you see from the back rows, but that's zero dollars a purchase, pretty good. So you can't beat that, right? And if we have a look at the uh, most, like the grossing, the top grossing apps, there's uh, Microsoft, Spotify, Pandora, HBO, and the worst of all, Kim Kardashian. So these are the people that make the most money there. Looks like indies don't get much love. And to be honest, the worst from all for me is app review. This is what actually gets people off the app store. Because there are some guidelines, but let's admit it, they just wing it as it comes. All right, so let me get around to what actually inspired me to do this talk. It's my custom keyboard app called Doodle Doodle. So when we heard last year that finally there were going to be custom keyboards on the app store, me and my partner in our indie studio decided to make one. So we wanted to use cutting iOS 8 tech. API is just introduced and very fresh and new. So eventually it gets featured and so forth. Um, it was a unique idea at the time, and I think it still is a unique uh, app on the App Store. And uh, it works, it's well integrated. It works with a lot, of, uh, a lot of apps and so forth. So we got really, really excited about creating this product. 
So we produced the website, we produced a development blog in which we shared our hurt, like the problems and uh, you know, wins over the way. We created a lot of posts about it, we shared code from it on the internet, and we even produced a video ad um, that I want to show you right now, just to give you an idea what it's all about. Okay, I'm going to just put the mic down to my laptop and we hope that it works out with the sound. If you chat as much as I do, you're probably wondering, why isn't there an iPhone keyboard that gives me something more interesting than emoji, but less crazy than animated GIFs? Something I can use every day with everyone. Well, now there is. Me Doodle Doodle, an iPhone keyboard that gives you more than 300 stickers to express just the emotion you're looking for. It's really easy to use, the stickers are hand-drawn, and the name is Doodle Doodle. All right, so that was it. Thank you so much, you're too kind. You are too kind. So we did an amazing prep for this launch. And based on all the effort that we put into it, that was the result we expected. A big bunch of money. However, what actually happened was something else. It happened six code, Xcode 6, AKA 60 source kit crashes per second. It happened Swift 1. Whoops, arrays shouldn't work like that for the ones we used Swift 1. And happened iOS 8. Whoops, we didn't think this through. So um, a lot of technical hurdles along the way. But we overcome the technical hurdles. Technical hurdles is something that you can solve eventually. And when we did that, we realized that Apple is really making sure that we cannot earn any money with it. How come? There's a special set of rules in the guidelines that forbid you to earn from keyboards. First, keyboards cannot show ads, so you cannot really have um, ads income. Keyboards cannot have in-app purchases, so you can't really sell anything. And keyboards cannot link to their host app where people can buy stuff from in-app. So they really make sure that you cannot do that. The only way is to have a paid app, so people would pay in advance and then give your app a try. And we know that for indie apps, that's really difficult. And um, so we decided, okay, we're gonna release on the App Store. If we earn something, okay, if not, that's also fine. We anyways have the app ready to go. Turn out, there's further restrictions that Apple had to call us on the phone to tell us about. Like some kind of mobsters in the middle of the night. Yeah, and so, but we got over this as well. <laughs> and for anyone who has ever installed a custom keyboard, and I bet that's not many people here, this is the process of installing a keyboard on your, on your iPhone. So you have to pay for the app, download the app, install the app, run it once, and see this list of instructions that you have to follow as a user. You have to close the app, go to settings, choose general, from general choose keyboard, from keyboard find the item called keyboards, and go into keyboards, uh, Press on add new keyboard item, and that will give you a list of all available keyboards to install, in where you will have to find the one that you just downloaded, tap on it. Um, that will bring you to another screen <coughs> with the list of all that are now installed. You have to find again the one you installed, tap it, <laughs> and then that will bring you to a screen where there's a single switch that says allow full access. And when people tap the switch, this is what they see. I'm reading through. Full access allows the developer of this keyboard to transmit anything you type, including things you have previously typed with this keyboard. This could include sensitive information as your credit card number or street address. Take a good laugh. That's the natural reaction to this alert. So I feel like we did our part. I feel like we did develop an independent app. And we convinced people to find this app on the App Store. They probably used the search and they did the impossible. They found what I was searching for. And they paid in advance for something they didn't use so far. The impossible. And this is what Apple tells them when they go through all these hurdles. This guy is gonna steal your credit card. <laughs> so naturally, <laughs> when I laid it down like this in front of you, you can um, 
probably already guess it, I was pretty much the result of that endeavor. So what kind of precise profit we did make out of this? So it's an indie studio of two, and in the first six months, we made 680, uh, sorry, 768 euros. And since we are two, and we split equally, I got 384 euros. However, I have to subtract from this amount my hospital bill, which brings us to minus in 316 euros. Now you're gonna say, wait, why do you put your hospital bill on the um, balance in the app? Well, I told you how much effort we put into the release. So when one morning I was sitting in bed and uh, reading through the rejection message from Apple, I really felt really bad. I felt like my left half is really getting numb and I'm like, kind of like losing uh, you know, a sense of the room and everything. So what happened was pretty much this. What is going on here? I was in Berlin at the time. I can't breathe so well and my left half is numb. Schnell, make him an EKG. <laughs> oh, my boyfriend, don't die on me. <laughs> Let's see about that. <laughs> Come with us if you want to live. <laughs> so they didn't really say come with us if you want to live, but we did have to go to the hospital and pay up the bill. So uh, that was pretty bad. Thank you. So everything's pretty bad. We're all going to die. Two people already left the room right now. But let me pan out a little bit. Let me zoom out a little bit on my year around the release of this app. I released this app from Washington, D.C., where I was for a couple of weeks. That was pretty awesome. I was there for a conference, RWDFCon, pretty good conference. Um, and then after, just after um, I released it from Washington, I spent a couple of weeks in Bavaria, which was really great. Bavaria is a perfect place. And then we were off with my girlfriend to Bali for about a month. And before the release of the little, actually I was to Prague for a couple of weeks um, to relax a little bit before going to Washington. And before Prague, I was in Lisbon. I spent the whole autumn there because Lisbon is a fantastic place. And before Lisbon, I was walking from Portugal to uh, Santiago de Compostela in Spain on the El Camino de Santiago. That was amazing. So things are not really matching everything I said so far. There's some kind of twist in here, right? <laughs> so is this how the Indiepocalypse looked like or not? So somebody will say, well, Marin probably already has money. His family is rich. They, his, his mom is sending uh, transfer wires all the time, like each week. So he can just you know, travel around and uh, have fun and then release unsuccessful apps. A fair guess, but that's not really the case. Unlike most of you, I come from the other side of the Iron Wall. So um, I was supposed to be just a pawn in Russia's plan to take over the world. Uh, so that's definitely not a rich origin, right? Okay. All right, so not a lot of money. And I also could not really study because of that. And that brings me to a place called Berlin um, where I had the most horrible job in the world and made me feel really, really miserable. So and that job was just, just awful, just the most horrible one. I can't really even begin to describe it. I don't really have the time to. So when I quit this job, I was completely convinced that I'm going to be an independent um, from then on because of my fear that there will be another company like that that I will just, by mistake, stumble upon and then get hired from. So I quit. I wasn't so sure what to do. A couple of friends came and said, let's make an indie business. And what it took us to do that was jump on the tram, ride it for 20 minutes, go to the mall and buy an iPod Touch. And there we go. We had an indie business now. <laughs> it was pretty good. And everything from then on was perfect. Um, we were all rich and famous, rode unicorns, and there was wine coming out of the fountains. It was pretty good. 
Um, but that's over with, right? Like we don't have this anymore. We used to launch apps that could make good money, but not anymore. It looks like the indies are being exterminated. Like somebody wants us out of the app store. Actually, I don't think that. A lot of people think that, and a lot of people write this publicly, but I don't really agree. I don't think so. Everything changed for me how I see the app store and how I see this industry when I took this Coursera course called Developing Innovative Ideas for New Companies. It's by Dr. James Green. It's a free course on the internet, which actually taught me a very important concept that I did not know about before. And that was the concept of industry age. So whenever some kind of industry is being born, it's in this infancy age, and there is some kind of rules that uh, govern this age of the industry. Then it gets into youth, then it gets into adulthood, and then it dies naturally, like everything in this world. And to give you an example, I put in together a little slide so we can just go quickly through and maybe we can be on the same page. For example, the electrical telegraph. Before the electrical telegraph come, people had to send their mail with the mail coach. Delivery was not guaranteed, and it was pretty slow and horrible. Then, in 1838, the first commercial telegraph services launched in the US and UK, so this basically was when the industry was born. And uh, from then on, people could launch their own telegraphic services, right, from this year on, because the tech was there, so everybody could just launch a venture based on this. But it was not that easy. Not everyone knew about electricity even, so it was not just, hey, let's do a telegraphical service. Because at this time, launching an international company was also not that easy. So it was actually very difficult to launch one. Then later on in 1850, the first intercontinental or rather international call happened between the UK and Europe, um, where Queen Victoria spoke to uh, President Napoleon um, over the channel. And that pretty much convinced everyone that this is a viable market. So there, there are money to be made there. So a lot of people will launch um, ventures like that and make good money. And then later on, 1901, first wireless telegraphic call happened over the Atlantic. And it was obvious that the electrical telegraph was going to go down. This is where the industry entered the adulthood. So there were still some money to be made, but less and less, and it was less viable and it was less relevant. And now we have Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp. Nobody cares about this tech anymore. All right. So let's make a quick parallel with the App Store. Before the iPhone, we had Game Boy, Nintendo, VHS cassettes, and so forth. I'm sorry to the ones of you who don't know what a VHS cassette is, but... Okay, so in 2007, this industry was born. The app, the iPhone app industry was born, and it was great. But it was so difficult to enter this business that there was only one developer, Apple. And then they released the SDK so other people can jump on the entrance barriers were really high. So you had to write Objective-C, pre-ARC. And that was not that easy. So not so many people could do it. It was not that easy to launch a company like that. And then we're about now where the, inf the industry will, in my own calculation, enter youth. So everybody's sure there's a lot of money to be made and there's a lot of money to be you know, spread around and so forth. So there's going to be more and more and more and more more and more companies to do that. And eventually, sometime in the future, probably very soon, all this is going to get wiped out. Nobody's going to have an iPhone. Everybody's going to have some electrical islands of some sort or something like that. So people are going to be, app, whatever you mean. So um, yeah, this is also natural, things getting replaced all the time. And just to make sure that I'm getting through here with the industry age, let's have a look at the most natural parallel I can make. Let's have a look at, the, at humans. So in the infancy age of humans, what do you do? You just lay on your back, maybe move a little, smile, let out a colorful poop, and everybody's really happy with you. They leave you five-star reviews all the time. Wow, a green one, what an angel. So everybody, everything's pretty easy, right? Everything you do is being praised. That's great, so anything you do, just great. If we compare it to the human youth, nobody wants you to do that. 
the same products are not viable anymore. They don't work the same way. So if you let out a green poop, please don't tell me. One star review for you. So, um, so you see that the conditions change as, as the industry matures, and, and, and in, in different ages, not the same thing work. If we have a quick look at the App Store, this is what the infancy of the App Store looked like. The number one farting machine. So there were more, but this one was the best. And also, iBeer, this time with milk as an in-app purchase. <laughs> and of course now, in the App Store Youth, those are just forbidden by the guidelines. Nobody wants this anymore. So conditions change, products change. The same products don't work anymore as good in different ages. Fartly 2015 is not gonna fly. RSSify, we have a million of RSS readers. It's really difficult to launch a new one that will be relevant. To do Pro 2015, totally not just Apple's example app, also probably is very difficult to make be relevant. So conditions change and you have to act accordingly. It is really difficult to launch your first product and be successful. It used to be the case, not the case anymore. It should be a high quality app. So fart apps don't really work anymore. It is probably a good idea to team up or hire people because in the beginning of the app store, in the, in the infancy of the app store, it was a viable idea to work on your own. But that's really difficult right now because just the quality, just the bar is high. In the, in the beginning of the app store, we all thought, well, there's two million people having an iPhone. I'm going to launch a 99 cent app. I'm going to be a millionaire. That was naive even at the time. And now it's even just ludicrous to think that. So launching in a niche where people would actually be interested in your app is the only way. And last but not least, Apple didn't promise you nothing. Actually, they just wanted you to make apps, so they sell more iPhones. And those iPhones will break, so they will say even more iPhones. And those new iPhones will also break, so they will say more iPhones until they're the richest company in the world. But now they are, so uh, you know they didn't really promise you not a thing. In fact, I went to the keynote where Steve Jobs, this awesome guy, you probably remember him, announced the deal for developers. And his deal was, developers picks the price, any price you want, you get 70% of the revenue right off the top. There's no credit card fees, Apple takes care of all that. There's no hosting fees, Apple takes care of all that. There's no marketing fees. He takes a deep breath, skips a beat, and goes on. It's paid monthly. So he never promised that he's going to market your products and love you. So what I say is the App Store is a delivery platform. And it's up to you to have a business using this platform. And you're going to say, are you saying that I need a real business? But real business means that I need to have accounting. I need to have marketing. I need to have social media experts and hiring people. And now somebody in the back row will jump and say, but I'm good at programming. Yes, you are. And that's the best valuable asset you have business-wise because doing your own marketing can hurt your product. Doing your own programmer art, definitely gonna hurt your product. So if you just focus on what are you actually good at, you can really make a difference, not only for your business, but actually for humanity, even. So what changed things a bit? Really remember when I was in this horrible situation in Berlin, having these horrible feelings, uh, quit my job with no idea what to do. Actually, I stumbled upon this book called The 4-Hour Workweek. And besides the marketing title, inside there's very good insights about running a business. And it's that you have to focus on what you're good at and not lose your time with what you're not good at. And this brought, I followed this deep heartedly, and this brought amazing stuff my way. For example, this happened. I really focused on developing a fantastic app, and I have the screenshot in a folder on my desktop. Every now and then, I open it, and I have a look at it and say, Marin, good job. So just to make sure everyone sees what happened was build boot, my app is first, there is a lot of Photoshop, then it's MobileMe, then it's Life, then it's Guardian, and then 
at the very bottom, just almost outside of top 10, Picasso. So I focused on really doing a great app, and that worked out. And then I focused on really great, doing a fantastic video course because that looked at fun. That looked at something that I can do. There's 5,000 people who took it, and they were really happy with it. So that was really great. And then I really loved programming, and I really loved writing. So I thought, how about writing about programming? And teamed up with an awesome guy called Ray Wendelik, and we did a really fantastic lineup of books that really made me happy because I was doing what I loved. People loved <laughs> what I loved. Everybody was loving everyone. That was fantastic. <laughs> and so after that, <laughs> thank you. So I focused on not doing anything I don't like and focused on doing only things I like. For example, open source. Fantastic feedback. Got me connected to so many people. I focused on only doing what I felt like doing. I have a newsletter, send around free code to everyone who wanna use it, and that makes me happy. So that takes us back to where we started. Doodle doodle. Well, shortly after we launched on the App Store, I got an email from a company that said, we wanna give you money. So that made me pretty happy. <laughs> having the perspective of what I already told you half an hour ago. So they said, we want to license your source code because we had a really good look at your app and it really feels like you put a lot of effort into all the details and all the stuff. So uh, we just want to license the code to launch our own app um, using your source code, but our own content. That was pretty cool. I was pretty happy with that. But the most important thing is that by focusing on what you really love to do and what really makes difference, you feel great yourself. You have time for your loved ones, you have time for yourself, you have time to relax. And so, everything is pretty good if you have the right attitude. And some of you are gonna say, then what? You started in one place, you took us around the world, and you ended up with a big coconut in your hands. So, is there an apocalypse or isn't there an apocalypse? What we should do? What is your point? Well, <laughs> fair enough. Um, I honestly do think there is still opportunity on the App Store. We thought back in the time that 15,000 apps are way too many. We said everything's already done. 15,000 apps is more than anyone could need. But now we have <laughs> much more. And there is still an opportunity in there for you to have a business and to make a difference. And if you're sick of the iOS App Store, why not go to the Mac App Store? The Mac App Store is this just big, vast emptiness full of garbage. So you can launch a viable app in there as an indie and still be successful. For example, this app is called Monodraw and lets you draw ASCII art. It's fantastic, I really love it. I paid for it and I loved it. And if you're sick of the Mac App Store, why just don't go to the web, like Cesare Rocchi, who is not here today, unfortunately. So he said, I'm sick of app review. I'm gonna make web services that are gonna be related to the app store in some way, but I'm not gonna de be dependent on Apple. So, for example, this is a web service that pings you every time one app that you're interested in have a new version. It just sends you a Twitter or an email, which is really great for bloggers, app reviewers, and things like that. So, Jezre used, leveraged his um, iOS skills and Apple skills and created a viable product that doesn't depend on Apple. So this is great. He's really independent in this sense. Why don't you do open source? You will say open source is free. Well, that is true, but in the long haul, actually not. Because all of the open source libraries that I launched from, from the pure desire to share my code with the world actually brought customers to me that wanted to do contract work for them. And I said, yes, but I charge a lot. They said, sure. So that was really, really awesome thing. So open source is also fantastic. Why don't you partner up? There's so many awesome people you can approach and partner up. Um, and the iOS community, of course, is a super friendly community. You can do work together as a team or not, doesn't really matter. But if you do team up, then you can launch really bigger scale projects that are having more impact and then are having more difference. And finally, 
to end up on and this my plot twist here that I promised in the uh, description. Why don't you get hired? <laughs> Actually, these days, getting hired as an iOS developer is pretty, pretty different. There's organic beef, there's company retreats, ping pong, um, unlimited beer. It is actually pretty nice. Just make sure that you're not stranded, that you're actually having a good time. And then you also can be hired. It's, it's all great because this industry is just getting into youth now. We have an amazing technology, we have a fantastic platform, and we are the experts because we were here first. That's how it is. So we are experts developing conceptually new solutions thanks to groundbreaking technology in an industry in its infancy age. All you have to do is have a little bit of persistence and be really consistent about it. That's how it is. Thank you. Time for questions? Yeah, it was perfect. Uh, thank you for the great talk. I think it was really inspiring. Um, so in retrospective, what do you think were, were the main mistakes with the Doodle Doodle app? That is a fantastic question. I was not prepared for that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what, we, what we probably should have done was to try to contact Apple before we launched because they had something in mind they wanted people to do, but they didn't really say it. And everybody that did something different than what I had in mind had to wait a bit and get rejected a few times uh, before Apple kind of like gets around, around what they had in mind. And, uh, you know. Because I spoke with other people who launched keyboards, which was exactly in the, in the, in the um, that did exactly what Apple wanted. And Apple wanted just to copy uh, what was there on Android. They did not want to have something different. And they didn't realize it until a lot of people tried to do other things. So yeah, so probably contacting them in advance, trying to get somebody to just talk to, uh, say, we have this idea, what do you think, um, you know, would have been much better. Just more communication. Yeah. How, how simple is the contact? Well, you send them an email, and um, you, you will get an uh, automatic reply. And hopefully in a few days, maybe somebody will write to you, actually. It is not really that difficult to go and you know, get hold of someone. And actually, conferences are the best place to get hold of someone because people are there. So uh, if, you, if you are sneaky enough, you can just <laughs> have a look at all conferences on the internet in the world, find where somebody from Apple is speaking, <laughs> and just be here in front <laughs> first row. <laughs> Uh, and you know, like they are also people, so they will like help you. Like in a, in a few minutes, we'll just you know you can talk to them. Hey, thank, thanks a lot for bearing your soul and uh, letting us know about how you developed. Uh, now you had a success in the end with your story, and I was just wondering uh, how you found somebody to do your design, how you found somebody to do your marketing, because uh, I, I I'm thinking that you probably found somebody since you're saying do what you love. That is. Good point. Um, so <clears throat> in our studio, I'm the programmer, and my partner is um, the designer and graphical artist. So he would produce all the graphics for it, um, including all the banners and things like that. But we actually stayed away from doing you know, small-scale indie marketing, because from our experience, showed that, that any money you would put into mar indie marketing is just going down the drain. So you can have a you know, a nice vacation instead. You will have more benefit from it. So advertisement and marketing, from my experience, again, works only on big scale. Um, spoke to a lot of game studios, and they usually say that if you drop under a certain amount of money that you put every day, your daily usage drops instantly. And that was you know, depending on the country and the target audience, but that was about 10,000 a day. So that's not really our scale. So we just prefer to have good time 
and save this money and uh, use them to coconuts and stuff. Yeah, so uh, how about doing making the, uh, the ad uh, material? That was, your, that was your designer friend. He also does the ad material. Yeah, we, we actually we did not plan to have a video ad, but one day we were just playing with video and then it was like, ah, let's just put it together. That's, it, it looks like it looks easy. <laughs> But we did not launch on TV or anything like that. That would be would have been stupid. <laughs> now this ad is only on our website just for fun. <laughs> okay. Hi Mari, thanks for a great talk. I have two quick questions. The first one: How do you identify a niche market? And the second one is, do, if you have any good suggestion or advice for people that actually want to quit the job and then get into the indie right now. Okay, number one, how do you identify a niche market? I think that's very important. The, the problem with, 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 with the App Store, or actually with any product, but specifically with the App Store, is that if you launch an app that is, that is supposed to appeal to everyone, and it's supposed to be a snap decision purchase for 99 cents, then your biggest value is that you're cheap, right? So people don't respect you. And there will be millions of people that probably get your app, or billions if it's free. But in that case, they won't really feel connected with it. If it was a snap decision to buy it, it will be a snap decision to leave you a review like, it doesn't do what I wanted. And of course, if you're trying to appeal to everyone, then you cannot really satisfy everyone. And a niche market will be, my biggest advice is target professionals. Professionals need tools because they make their money like that. They make their money by being professionals and tools you know, solve their pains. So if you have, if you have um, I don't know, um, if you know somebody, one of your friends is a video, like a film director. So film directors need a lot of tools and a lot of these tools frankly are analog tools. And some of these pains could be solved by a proper software. Um, so this is an interesting niche market. If you target them, you can ask, hey, um, you know, you've paid $12 million for Brad Pitt. How about pitching in with $100 here for my software? And they're probably going to say, fine, sure. As, as long as you know, I can do my job easier, why not? And then when they pay $100 for the app, they'll be like, huh that actually solved my pain, so let me leave a five-star review. Or, that didn't solve my pains. Since I paid $100 for it, let me, contract, uh, let me contact the developer and ask them about it, instead of just snap decision to leave a one-star review and go and try something else. So this is my perspective on this, this, this niche thing. So, professionals, what they need. This is the, this is the most rewarding market, I think. And the second one was something else, but I forgot. Um, of course. <laughs> it's always like this with two-parter questions. <laughs> so. Yeah, sorry about it. Uh, if you have any advice for people that are actually interested in being oh, yeah. in the right now. Okay. Um, if you're independent, the most important thing is network. Um, so you already done the first step, you're at this conference you are building up your network, you're getting skills, that's really awesome. Um, but of course, as I showed, since the barriers are very low into launching a new business on the App Store right now, um, indies are bound to make less money. And indies are bound to don't make it as often in the App Store. So in the infancy age, anyone who jumps in with no matter what kind of skills could have been successful. Right now, it's, it's really, we are really on the edge. So it's not really so sure what is gonna happen if you jump on the indie train right now. You might make it, you might launch a few products and maybe one of them will be successful, but that's now very, very difficult. And that's why you have to act accordingly. Uh, so actually teaming up with people on a product that, is, that, is, that increases your chances of success immensely. So just sitting yourself, coding all night long, Ignoring your wife and kids on the weekend to produce your own app might not be a good idea because you're just um, not acting accordingly to the present day. So I guess my point was build a network, 
make a team, uh, and be sure that you're knowing what you're doing. Just going wild randomly around, screaming around like a chickenless, uh, like a headless chicken won't really do it anymore. Like it did it in the infancy. Stop me now. So I think we are now out of time. So thank you, Martin. Thanks for coffee break. <laughs>